in Kyiv. This is the Sunday show on Hromatsky International, the only prime time TV program explaining the Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I'm Natalia Hmenyuk. That's what we have prepared for you tonight. Ukrainian President Poroshenko met Donald Trump. What did this lead to? How does Russia support the Taliban? The Ukrainian government's plan for the deoccupation of Donbass, what are the details? The life of use in the separatist-controlled Donetsk and Luhansk. And sexual abuse in military conflicts, the lessons learned. Go to our webpage en.hromatsky.ua, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, search Hromatsky International, and we'll be back in a second. Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko met with U.S. leader Donald Trump at the White House this week. It was one of the several high-level meetings for Poroshenko, who also spoke with Defense Secretary Jim Mattis and U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. The White House said the meeting between Trump and Poroshenko was about ways to resolve the conflict in East Ukraine. Yet there are very little details about how it should be done and the role of the U.S. Meanwhile, American media attention was revealed to smaller details of the meeting between the two presidents. The brevity of this dialogue caused much speculation. We are talking to Hannah Thurburn in DC, research fellow at the Hudson Institute, where she focuses on Russia, Ukraine, Eastern European politics and the transatlantic relationship. So we are really talking a lot in Ukraine, obviously, about the Ukrainian president's vis visit to uh, Washington, D.C., but how it's seen from the U.S., you know, how successful it was, can we assess it? There are all those details about the very short meeting with the President Trump, but there are also the, uh, there were the meetings with the Defense Secretary, with the State Secretary. So what can you, uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so Natalia, it, it, it's a little bit difficult actually to tell. A lot of us here in Washington, um, frankly, found it a little strange that there wasn't uh, a statement from the State Department that the president of Ukraine was going to come. And that after those meetings, most of the statements actually came from the Ukrainian side. It, it, I think there's a lot of questions here as to whether or not it was done that way because the trip was so sudden and because it was organized very quickly, or whether or not it's because the State Department is very shorthanded and they don't have enough people who are working on this issue right now. But it, it was frankly rather a strange trip. It's hard to see um, what is going to come out of it other than President Poroshenko's statement, which I think is true, how important it was for the Ukrainian president to meet with Trump before Trump meets with Putin. What we can know about this current state of affairs regarding the support of the U.S. and their role in the conflict, in, in the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. U.S. Congress really feels very strongly about supporting Ukraine. I think it was important that you saw that new sanctions bill come out of the Senate. It's now gone over to the House. Uh, and that really makes mention of Ukraine it attempts to enshrine the sanctions that are now only law because of executive orders created by President Obama, but could very easily be overturned by President Trump. So they're trying to put those in law, in large part because they do care about Ukraine, they do care about uh, the issues of Crimea and Donbass, and they're trying to force the administration's hand to do something, I think, on the Ukraine question. The other interesting thing that did happen the same day that President Poroshenko came to Washington was that the Treasury Department and Justice Department released their kind of maintenance sanctions that they do every six months or so on the sets of sanctions that have already been put on Russia for what it's done in Crimea and Donbass. And very interestingly, in this set of maintenance sanctions, you had a whole group of people that it seems the Ukrainian government really did want sanctioned, and those are people who are involved in the day-to-day -day, um, violence that's going on in Donbass. So there are a bunch of issues uh, currently discussed. Would there be a special envoy uh, for the uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Ukrainian conflict uh, in the U.S.? Uh, 
is there any more general discussion on uh, like which would be launched between Ukraine and the US um, not just on the Minsk agreement or something but the broader context of the relations with uh, Russia and we really don't know have the if this discussion have already started uh, there is also the question would there be somebody else uh, in, instead of Victoria Nuland to talk to the Russian politician Surkov who is in charge of uh, Ukraine um, in the Kremlin. So um, really, to what extent are those things discussed in Washington by the people who are really deeply interested in the, the con into the uh, into the issue and who could be the really uh, specialists and experts on the topic? So that first question, the question about a potential special envoy, that is being discussed. Um, it has been reported in the news media here that that is a position that Secretary Tillerson wants to create. Uh, it's also been reported that they've offered that position to several people uh, and they have been turned down. I do think it's clear that uh, Victoria Newland is not going to be in that position because she's no longer at the State Department. One other thing that is clear is that the Ukraine-Russia conflict has really become part of Secretary Tillerson's portfolio. He seems to be the one who is in charge of deciding uh, what the next steps on this are. And I think it's important also to, to mention that we still don't have someone who is directing uh, the Europe and Eurasia Bureau. There's lots of rumors about who that person may be. But we're, we're already six months into this Trump administration. We don't have someone who's running um, officially that bureau. Ambassador Heffern, who's the acting head of that bureau, is doing a fine job. But he's not politically empowered in the way that a political appointee in that position would be. So there's lots of problems, I think lots of questions as to um, the seriousness with which the Trump administration takes this question. But, you know, there's a lot of growing pains I have hope that within six more months we might get to something that seems to be a more workable when we read the U.S. Uh, press on those on that visit, there were a lot of details uh, drawn into the uh, problems of, with the protocol of the red carpet, which hadn't been there, uh, on the way how short was that visit. Um, so really, I mean, you know, Ukrainian obvi Ukrainians obviously paid attention, but really, how do you see that coverage, and was there anything uh, essential and important to pick up from? Uh, from the details behind the visit and from the coverage itself? So I, I'm, I'm a little leery to focus in on all of those details because it's not clear to me how far in advance this particular visit was planned. Um, there was some note that when President Trump had met with, I believe it was the president of Panama, uh, just a day or two before, they had spent time taking a walk around the Rose Garden, around the White House, uh, and that that was not a courtesy that was afforded to President Poroshenko. But I think those questions can often be explained away by how far in advance the trip was planned, um, what kind of communication there was on it. I think it was noticeable and notable that um, Ambassador Marie Ivanovich did come to the, to the United States alongside uh, President Poroshenko. I think that was a, an important signal that this is something that the U.S. government is taking seriously. And I think, you know, to have a diplomat of her status being able to work alongside President Poroshenko, State Department, Defense Department, I do think that was a positive signal. But, you know, on the whole, I think a lot of these concerns about, well, the carpet wasn't red and there wasn't a meeting with the wives, it's a little bit... Um, overblown, frankly. I think different countries ask for different courtesies. And this was labeled specifically a working visit, not an official visit. So it's not surprising that there was no red carpet and that there was no uh, pomp and circumstance. But, you know, on the whole, I do think it's a good thing that this, that this visit was able to happen and to happen early on in the Trump administration. We'll see where things go. I think a lot of it really depends, as I just said, on what happens within the Trump administration and as they're putting people in place. I think that's really going to make a large amount of the difference. And it's been slow going to this day. And that's not just in Europe and not just in Eurasia. It's in other parts of the world as well. 
Since the start of the war in Eastern Ukraine, the questions of the occupation of Donbass and the legal status of the anti-terrorist operation has been raised many times. It's been more than a week since we learned about the introduction of the new concept proposed by the Security Council and supported by the President of Ukraine. Since no document have been provided to the public, analysts and politicians have been talking about different scenarios, including the reformatting of the Minsk peace agreements and even the possibility of military developments. Hromatsky has obtained the draft of the bill and we are sharing what it contains with you. While we would like to stress that without the final version of this document we don't have any opportunity to have a professional discussion on the issues or the impact of the changes on the lives of Ukrainians. Acknowledging the fact that the anti-terrorist operation, or ATO, introduced in April 2014 doesn't liberate the east of Ukraine, the Ukrainian government ordered the preparation of the state policy on restoring Ukrainian sovereignty in the currently occupied territories. The contents of this document is the subject of speculation, but this week Hromadsky received a copy of the concept for this draft law. Hromadsky's sources emphasize that the document might be amended and added to. The key points of the document outline that the use of Ukrainian forces to restore the territorial integrity of Ukraine is at the President's discretion. An operational headquarters for the Donetsk and Luhansk regions will be created, the temporarily occupied territory will be governed by the Constitution and laws of Ukraine, and sovereignty will be restored on the basis of national and international legislation. No details have been provided as of yet. Citizens in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions will live under Ukrainian law, but state-regulated economic activity import and or export of military goods, and the organization of transport connections will be prohibited in these territories. It is also forbidden to use public resources to send remittances. The means by which this will be achieved are not outlined. The formal maintenance of the Minsk peace agreements is also included. The concept text does not specify who occupied the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, although a potential new regime for the management of the territory and the priority of diplomatic means of deoccupation are prescribed, the details of the deoccupation plan are not yet available. To know more on this topic, visit our website and read the detailed article we prepared for you. What we also know is that the bill might be voted in the Parliament by the end of this cycle of the plenary session, meaning by mid-July. How is the life of youth in the occupied territories of Donbass? The youngsters are still trying to live like they used to, separate from all political situations. We talked to an artist from Luhansk, Yevhen Karaleta. After the Russian aggression, he moved from his native town, joined a volunteer battalion, but now has launched the ironically titled magazine Golden Call, about alternative culture in the separatist control Luhansk and Donetsk. Я жил в Луганске, а тут получается, что меня фактически выгнали. Ну, уехал я, в принципе, сам, но если бы я не уехал, то у меня были бы какие-то проблемы с дальнейшей жизнью. Даже если бы я ничего не делал, рано или поздно меня вышли, например, как на активиста Луганского Майдана. А, вина в том, что я не способствовал тому, чтобы этот конфликт как-то закончился, можно сказать, я наоборот способствовал тому, что он продолжался. Золотой уголь или золотой уголек. Почему ирония? Она, собственно говоря, у него такая постинтернет эстетика и ну, такой небольшой пафос, знаешь, вот как, как не знаю, рэп-клипы, трэп-клипы. Вот, и вот. Я как бы иронизирую над этим пафосом. В основном вся информация, которая вот, э, крутится по телевизору или там в новостях по интернету, она э, используется в пропагандистских целях. Можно они тут, на материку? Угу. И, собственно говоря, ну, если бы я никакое отношение к Луганскую не имел, если бы я не имел там никаких знакомых оттуда, если бы я не, я не следил, ну, там, допустим, через соцсети, что, что там происходит, то я бы думал, что там вот живут одни суровые боевики, которые иногда друг друга стреляют. Кроме боевиков есть некая власть, которая из этих боевиков состоит, но, но может быть не только. И эта власть иногда принимает какие-то законы, там, что бы еще отжать у, у пенсионеров, которые вот тоже звали Путина и теперь остались там жить, тоже вот наслаждаться как бы грядущим коммунизмом. Но я 
имею там знакомых, и я с ними время от времени общаюсь. Более того, эти знакомые в том числе выезжают и в Украину довольно часто. И я знаю, что там происходят и другие процессы, в том числе, вот, например, связанные с искусством. Ну, я раньше уже не ушла. Я раньше пошла, раньше вернулась. У меня как-то это быстрее случилось. Ну, не знаю, опять же, наверное, я почувствовала, что того, чего я хотела, я там тоже не получила. То есть мне все равно казалось, что это такое же точно бездействие, только оно как-то прикрывалось тем, что вот якобы мы тут нужны, мы что-то делаем. А по факту я чувствовала, что мы, ну, если и делаем, то не то, что мне бы хотелось. И первоначально мне хотелось лично через кино вот тоже, да, доносить какие-то такие вещи, ну, то есть мы старались подбирать как-то тематические фильмы, которые, возможно, вот, ну, как-то давали бы посмотреть на конфликт там, с разных точек зрения, и вот подбирали фильмы, в которых, собственно, были похожие ситуации, вот как у нас сейчас. Ну, и как бы, ну, вообще разные темы затрагивали, то есть... Помимо военного конфликта проблем хватает. То есть как бы это и вопросы каких-то толерантного отношения вообще к людям, возможно, другой ориентации, возможно, других взглядов, там, религиозных, политических, ну, неважно, как бы таких аспектов моря. Ну и плюс, наверное, это была ну, как моя личная необходимость вот, в создании какого-то круга такого людей, где ну, познакомиться с людьми, вот как-то попытаться найти, возможно, единомышленника. Снимал, снимал, пока у меня не созрела идея э, сделать фильм. И фильм этот был посвящен э, такому общему, что есть у меня, что есть у Ромы, что есть у других э, моих э, друзей, знакомых из Луганска, которые проезжают через Северодонецк или приезжают сюда к родителям, переселенцам, которые сюда выехали. И это общее, это такое вот ощущение, что они немного не вписываются в, как бы, в картину жизни, что они чужие как бы и там, и здесь. Причем там и здесь, да, для каждого из моих знакомых ну, разные понятия. Вот мы сколько в Севере, уже вдвоем мы здесь год, и... Ну, для меня, вот, ну, и для Жени, наверное, <смех> лес — это вообще как самая комфортная среда здесь, и, не знаю, то есть, ну, мы его обживаем, по-моему, гораздо лучше, чем город, вот, как-то у нас там уже есть свои места, и вот наполняем его как-то, и, ну, <смех> вот, собственно, с ним и хочется взаимодействовать, потому что как-то, как часть города, я, ну, я вот чувствую, что я не вписываюсь. Для меня Зальцев это такая небольшая метафора. Например, есть какая-то среда, и есть человек, который хочет что-то в ней изменить, но он делает это ну, не совсем, допустим, естественным способом, а вот так вот именно искусственно. Я себя чувствую как бы между двух культур, или даже не знаю, ну да, между двух культур. Есть некая украинская культура, есть некая культура луганских народных республик, что-то там такое. И я смотрю, что, в принципе, мне не близка, конечно, культура луганских народных республик, но и то, что сейчас происходит в Украине, я тоже не совсем понимаю. И даже можно сказать наоборот, что те процессы, которые сейчас происходят в Украине, в том числе в культуре, они не совсем, так сказать, учитывают мое мнение или даже учитывают мое существование. Is Moscow supporting the Taliban in Afghanistan in its fight against ISIS? How can we assess Russia's lethal military intervention in Syria? To what extent is the Kremlin strengthening its leverage in the Middle East? And how does it all influence NATO policy in the region? We had a chance to talk to Amin Tarzi, the director of Middle East Studies at Marine Corps University in the US, about the change in Russian policy in the region and it moves towards actively courting Middle Eastern countries 
countries and establishing its voice in the region. So, um, I mean, you've uh, following closely, and that's a part of your expertise, the um, the counterterrorism, in particular in central, in Afghanistan and in the Middle East and all and that part of the world. So, you raise a question that there is a less uh, popular known topic about the Russian involvement in Afghanistan, in particular, what is that, what we need to know about that? Uh, there's a branch of the Islamic State, or ISIS, in Afghanistan that's called ISKP, Islamic State in Khorasan province, which is a terrorist organization according to the U.S. Also, there's the Taliban. The Taliban uh, are not considered a terrorist organization. They are considered a violent extremist organization. Uh, what is happening today in Afghanistan is the Afghan government is fighting both of these groups and some other smaller groups. However, the Russians are now coming in and s trying to reconcile with the Taliban. And the Russian rationale is that ISKP is a threat to Russia and Central Asian states such as Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, whereas the Taliban are not a threat to Russia, which is a, which is a fact. Uh, the Taliban are more of a nationalistic organization, meaning what? Uh, they do acts of terror, but they do it within the context of Afghan state. They do not go beyond the Afghan state, whereas ISKP is an internationalist terrorist organization. The Taliban are fighting these groups. So what Russia is looking at is supporting the Taliban uh, diplomatically and also perhaps sending some arms uh, to keep a, 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 a uh, diplomatic relationship, if you want. Uh, so on one hand, they are correct in saying that the Taliban are fighting ISIS, and therefore and it's in the advantage of Russia. The problem arises that the Taliban are also fighting the Afghan state. So supporting the Taliban actually destabilizes the Afghan state. And in the U.S. policy, the U.S. policy is to set up an Afghan government that is strong enough to hold the security of Afghanistan. The U.S. is not against negotiations with the Taliban, but it is against supporting the Taliban, specifically militarily or even politically, outside of this process that's going on. The main groups that are affiliated with the ISKP are the Uzbeks, the two which I mentioned, the two major Uzbek parties, but there are also some Chechens. Uh, IMU, the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, traditionally was based in Pakistan that the Pakistanis were pushing them out uh, from the, the frontier regions of Pakistan. So they came into Afghanistan, and there they were fighting the Taliban. So now they're being pushed northward, which is, for Russia, uh, that's a threat. And it's also for countries such as Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. So uh, the radicalization is not happening within Afghanistan. There are very few people within Afghanistan who are being radicalized to the ISKP. The Taliban are radical enough, but they, they're more they're gathering more of the Afghan support. So these foreigners, Uzbeks, Tajiks, uh, Chechens, Chechens are not that many, but there are some. Uh, they are obviously a threat to the stability of Central Asia, of Afghanistan, and perhaps of, of by extension of Russia, because as I said, they are uh, capable of carrying out attacks uh, beyond the borders of Afghanistan. Uh, the question again is, you're right that the United States is not directly involved in Central Asia as much. But Afghanistan is a domain where NATO is still involved under a uh, umbrella of what is called RS, or Resolute Support. Uh, the US is involved. And the idea is to strengthen the Afghan government, the Afghan national government, Afghan national army, and supporting them both to fight ISKP, but also the Taliban. So, as I said, on one hand, Russia has a rationale, but that rationale is, becomes very weak when you are supporting a group that is actually against the Afghan state. No, there are two types of thoughts about Russian, not just foreign policy, but uh, and the Kremlin itself. Some people would say we underestimate them, we don't look to how strong they are. Others would say, no, we are actually creating this myth which 
Vladimir Putin likes to be stronger than he is. You know, look at the ec Russian economy, look at the Russian military. They are uncomparable to, to NATO. They are uncomparable to, um, you know, to any other country. Uh, and they are not as good as they would like to look like, but we are creating the, the kind of somebody very big. So what would be your explanation? It, 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 look, the fact that they are in, in Syria shows that they have a, a power to uh, ex extend their forces. To, to, but at the same time, uh, the success in Syria is, again, how you look at success in Syria. They have propped up the regime of Bashar al-Assad. They, you know, they have taken some territory, but they're not targeting neither ISIS. They're targeting the same groups that the United States and Turk others support. They're also playing a very, very interesting game with Turkey. Uh, how they're reacting, with, for example, with, with the Kurds. They're not hitting the Kurds, but they're trying to have a voice. The footprint you see, the military footprint, is not very successful. And you're right. Some people exaggerate it, but that's how, when you put a military unit on the ground, you take advantage of that. That's nothing new. Uh, I don't think that they have the, the, the power to extend beyond what they have done, and even right now, and, and if you... Come in there, some people even say that Russia's bombing attempts, they were not very successful, but still to show that they have weapons is almost a, a, a way to show that, look, we, we, we have weapons that work and, and it's, a, it's a marketable uh, commodity. So whether this is a successful or not successful, the voice is there. And I think that in itself is a, a, is a step forward, if you would, at, at, at this strategy of becoming a partner or a player. I would say player more in the Middle East. They're partners with Syria. With Iran, the partnership is, is as much as people think about it. I don't think the Iranians trust the Russians as much. But right now, it's a, a, a need-based acceptability of, of both sides. There's not, I don't think there's a strategic relationship between Moscow and Tehran, even though they say there is. I don't think the Iranians trust the Russians. But right now, they don't have a lot of other friends in the region, so that's the only way to go to. So the fact, again, remains how successful or not, they're there. And the fact that they're there, they're affecting, and they're winning, at least in Syria, in the fact that Aleppo, some people don't see Aleppo as a, as a winning, but Russia's taken credit for Aleppo, at least partially. Uh, and the fact that Bashar al-Assad is, is right now walking in the streets of, of Damascus as, almost as a victor, you know, look here, there's peace. That gives Russia enough leverage. And, and, and very interestingly, within the so-called Arab street, meaning the Arab populace, all the bombings and all the killings you saw in Aleppo, somehow Russia was still liked. Whereas another, another country would have done that. United States or even another European country, you would have seen demonstrations against it. But somehow Russia's system is still effective that when they are even attacking civilians, uh, civilian convoys, they are not being reprimanded, at least on the popular, uh, popular uh, arena. Hromatsky's investigative unit took a closer look at how international humanitarian aid is used in Ukraine. It turned out that some volunteer organizations are not really helping soldiers or internally displaced persons, but rather themselves. Watch Hromatsky's report. Львівський підприємець Ростислав Макух допомагав армії з початком війни, а далі пішло-поїхало. Його благодійний фонд ввіз на територію України більше 40 гуманітарних вантажів. Все під суворим контролем. Ростислав показує стоси паперів. Переконує, відзвітувати може за кожен кілограм гуманітарки, яку отримав. Ростислав має специфічне хобі. Разом з іншими громадськими активістами він розслідує діяльність афористів, які видають комерційні вантажі за гуманітарну допомогу. В Україні понад тисяча організацій є отримувачами гуманітарної допомоги з-за кордону. В той час, коли відомі волонтери вибивають необхідний статус, сотні сумнівних організацій отримують від Міністерства соцполітики зелене світло та завозять тисячі тонн гуманітарних вантажів без будь-якого оподаткування. 
Ось база отримувачів гуманітарної допомоги. Її активісти уклали із опублікованих на сайті Міністерства соцполітики даних. Привертає увагу організація «Львівська жіноча рада». Назва не на слуху. Реальні волонтери зазвичай один одного знають. Львівська жіноча рада. Поїхали. 20 тонн. Майже 20 тонн. Тобто вже є 40. Львівська жіноча рада. Майже 20 тонн. Тобто вже 60. На папері Львівська жіноча рада ввезла сім гуманітарних вантажів за п'ять неповних років. Це майже 140 тонн або сім ось таких фур одягу та взуття. Документи на погодження останнього вантажу організація подала на початку цього року. Адресати – чотири благодійні фонди та низка фізичних осіб. У приватній квартирі цього будинку прописаний християнський громадський центр «Милосердя» який мав би отримати від Львівської жіночої ради 6 тонн гуманітарної допомоги. А ми розшукуємо громадський центр милосердя. Я навіть не знаю, в нашому домі такого. Ой, 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 є, є, такі є, я щось ви мене в розплох застали. Засновниця фонду на місці, а от сам фонд лише на папері. Свого підпису у документах Тетяна Іванова не впізнає. Так. Цього року нічого не підписано. Ну, от бачите, є от список. Я розумію, але вам ще раз кажу, цього року нічого. Але бачите, сюди завірено вашим підписом. А в кого взагалі печатка? У вас печатка милосердя? Ні, бухгалтерію. Зрештою, пані зізнається, погодилася стати засновницею та директоркою фонду на прохання однокласника. Я нанятий, якби той директор, але... А хто власник безпосередньо милосердя? Тримайте. Ви не знаєте, хто? Тобто ви... Ви просто підписуєте документи і нічого не знаєте? В принципі, так. Крім фонду милосердя, гуманітарну допомогу від Львівської жіночої ради мали отримати майже півтори сотні соціально незахищених осіб. Наша знімальна група навідалася за кількома адресами. Значить, тітки, що дзвонила дочці, вона нікуди нічого не давала, ніяких запросів. Вибачайте, я в хаваті. Ні, ніяких документів не подавав. У нас багатодітної сім'ї, дітей взагалі немає. І ви не є потребуючі? Ага. Ні. Тут, на околиці Львова, розташувався офіс, очевидно, фіктивного благодійного фонду. Саме Львівська жіноча рада начебто отримувала і розподіляла гуманітарну допомогу між соціально незахищеними. Засновниця організації – 25-річна Дзвенемира Довгалюк. Ще два роки тому шукала на сайті працелаштування роботу офіціянтки у Львові. За мене займається моя внука. А хто займається? У мене є бухгалтер. Бухгалтер? Так. А можна якось її дані вашого бухгалтера телефон? Думаю, ні. А чому? Ну, розумієте, що йде просто мова про підробку документів. Львівська жіноча рада – далеко не єдина організація, оформлена на Дзвенемиру Довгалюк. Як засновниця, вона фігурує ще в двох благодійних фондах, які також отримують гуманітарну допомогу з-за кордону. Цікаво, що одним з партнерів пані Довгалюк є Олег Олександров. Ниточки від цієї людини ведуть до народних депутатів з опозиційного блоку. Мовою документів, три організації «Дзвенемири Довгалюк» за останні три роки отримали майже 320 тонн гуманітарної допомоги. Співкоординаторка волонтерського центру Оксана Сухорукова пояснює, статус гуманітарного вантажу гарантує організації повний all-inclusive на митниці. Гуманітарний вантаж не сплачується при розмитненні 20% від вартості ПДВ, не сплачується мито, не сплачуються кошти за розмитнення, за послуги брокерів по гуманітарній допомозі. Там спрощена процедура розмитнення. Щороку в Україну завозять тисячі тонн гуманітарних вантажів з-за кордону. Як правило, це одяг, меблі, техніка. Однак під виглядом допомоги, до прикладу, Одеський фонд отримав з Китаю сковорідки «Гриль», дзвінки для виклику офіціанта та пробки для пляшок. Єврейська громада – делікатеси з Ізраїлю. В асортименті салямі, пастрома, маринований язик, швейцарський стейк. Києво-Печерській лаврі допомогли тракторами і комбайнами на загальну суму півмільйона євро.
А цей закон виписаний для того, щоб під виглядом гуманітарної допомоги можна було завозити ну, все, що завгодно. Sexual violence plays a role in any conflict, and the ongoing war in the east of Ukraine is no exception. Hromadsky met with Madeleine Rees, Secretary General of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, who is a former gender expert for the UN Human Rights Mission in Bosnia and Herzegovina, to discuss the relationship between war and sexual violence, peacekeeping's connection to human trafficking, and the role of women in peacekeeping process. In the process of preparation for this meeting, I, uh, I read a lot about uh, this Bosnian case. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable how, how the people who should actually to ensure the peace and uh, safety were involved in such terrible things like human trafficking, like uh, forced prostitution. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, um, what is the origin of such processes? It was the most incredible violation of human rights in one place, in a post-conflict, by peacekeepers that I think that has ever taken place. And trafficking, as in many of war-related uh, e economies, is all about financial gain. It's all about the extremism of capitalism, if you like. You ha have a, a poor market, you have a market in terms of you have, and in Bosnia, some 80,000 male peacekeepers who are there without family. Um, and you have a supply. I mean, talking about people as you know, the ability to supply people in Moldova, Ukraine, uh, Bulgaria to a certain extent, Romania, countries that had become impoverished and that women were willing to migrate to try to earn money. Um, and they weren't told that they were going to be forced into prostitution. They were told they were going to Germany or Greece to work in hotels. I hadn't met anyone from Ukraine until I went to Bosnia, and then I met hundreds of women from Ukraine who had been brought from Ukraine into Bosnia for the specific purpose of sexual exploitation. How did it happen? Because there was no, nothing to stop it. Are the guilty persons punished now? Are they sentenced? The, the worst perpetrators were actually um, found guilty and, and uh, sentenced to jail sentences. That said, many of the men who were successfully prosecuted are now out and free because they've served their sentences and they're back in Bosnia. Some of them are allowed to run to become mayors, to become politicians, to go back into the system. Um, and what sort of message does that send? Many, many men, the vast majority of those who perpetrated the crimes, were not prosecuted. And we can't blame the International Tribunal for that because the International Tribunal wanted to focus on the commanders, on the ones who organised the, the, the crimes against humanity and the war crimes, the genocide. Some have been punished. And I think that if we look at the positive, um, because of the incredible bravery and courage of the women from Bosnia, we now have an international law which recognises what rape really is in the context of conflict. It's changed the way in which we prosecute, if not think about rape. It's, it's been prosecuted as a crime against humanity, as persecution, in, as torture, very, very important, and in certain, certain circumstances as an element of genocide. What about uh, the peacekeeping forces, actually? Uh, has something changed inside this structure? We don't know of any single peacekeeping mission where there are no incidents of sexual exploitation. Um, the biggest one most recently has been in Burundi and in then in sorry Central African Republic where you know the it was the, the constant exploitation of children by peacekeepers. What has happened? Nothing. There is sexual violence committed by Ukrainian army and uh, by separatists and uh, also we know about the phenomenon of uh, prostitution for food. So there are several things that the government must do. It must insist on the training of the troops so that they know that if they commit an act like this, there will be prosecution and imprisonment if found guilty. But the commanders must be informed that they are the ones who are responsible. And this is a principle which is fundamental in preventing sexual violence. And so how to detect these women. The ways in which it worked in, in various different conflicts, and I will cite Bosnia as one, where there was um, a very good system of support. 
and that was to have NGOs who were providing medical assistance. And you would find that women will access medical assistance because it is often needed. And then by accessing that medical assistance, they can have the opportunity to talk about what happened to them. They don't have to, but if they want to, they can, and there'll be a counsellor available. And the best has a lawyer available as well. So if you want to talk to a lawyer, just to say, well, I want to give a statement. I'm not sure I want to prosecute, but I want to identify who it was. Or I want it recorded so that I can, at some point, maybe take part in a reparations programme. But you do it in such a way that there's the, the person who has survived the attack has agency. And it is confidential. It's also very, very important, that whether it be in conflict or non-conflict, that you have a responsive police to allegations of sexual violation. Going into a police station and being immediately interrogated as to where you were, you wanted to sleep with him because you wanted to have payment, weren't you? What you want is to have a safe space where you can talk, preferably to someone of the same gender, who understands and will take you seriously, who will take a statement from you, and give you the sort of support that's needed in order to go forward. We're a long way from that in Ukraine, but that is what the police reform is for, that is what the training has to be about. And I think really, really importantly, the way that rape has always been approached is that it's always a woman's fault, it's never the guy. And I think what will happen now with this increase in the knowledge of sexual assaults on men, sexual violations of men, it will show that the comments we were making about women were ridiculous. They've always been ridiculous. No one is going to say about the guy, well, what were you wearing when that guy raped you? No one is going to say, well, you were out drunk, weren't you? So what we're doing is we're actually showing it was always about power. It was always about the exploitation and assertion of your power over an individual. From the entire team of Romatic International, thanks for watching us. Check the full version of our reports and interviews at our webpage en.romatic.ua. Search and follow Romatic International on Facebook and Twitter. Stay tuned for our latest updates.